All right, well, good morning. We're, we're back for more fun with statistics and trauma. Um, today we're going to talk about non-parametric tests. Um, we've, we've already talked about most of the what we call the univariate uh, statistical tests where, where we can look at the, uh, the relationship between one independent variable uh, and, and a dependent or outcome variable. The last time we talked about analysis of variance, that's where you have more than two groups that you want to compare on some continuous outcome. And uh, just remember that, that ANOVA tells you that there's a difference somewhere, but it doesn't say where. So that's where those post hoc tests come, uh, come in. So you'll have to go back and, uh, and do some kind of uh, t-test or z-test uh, after the fact to, uh, to see where the differences lie, if, uh, if there is one. Chi-square is uh, the other one where you can compare multiple groups uh, uh, just across levels of a discrete variable. <clears throat> but remember with that, with chi-square, uh, you can only use that if the minimum expected value in any cell in the table is at least five. Here's a, a nice um, decision matrix for, uh, for figuring out which test to use. That's uh, often the, the biggest hurdle people have to, have to go through is just deciding what test do I use with this kind of data and this many groups. And we've already covered some of these here, the, the t-test or z-test for, uh, for two independent groups. Uh, for uh, dependent groups uh, with a continuous outcome, that's where we have the, the paired t-test. Uh, multiple groups, three or more subjects, or three or more uh, groups, uh, that's the analysis of variance if we're looking at continuous uh, data. With, with nominal or discrete data, we've uh, looked at that chi-square test, um, and, uh, and that's uh, used for, for two or more groups. But there are a number of other situations where you have uh, a different type of outcome variable <coughs> that um, have these confusing sounding names that don't really describe what they do. And that's what we're going to talk about, uh, a few of the, uh, the more commonly used um, non-parametric tests. So today we're going to just uh, discuss similarities and differences between parametric and non-parametric tests and look at some applications where non-parametric approaches are more appropriate uh, and go through some specific ones. Uh, the the Mann-Whitney U. Uh, sign test, Wilcoxon sign ranked, um, and, and talk about how they're similar and different from each other, Kruskal Wallace, uh, and, <coughs> and figure out based on the, the type of data and how many groups you have, which is a more appropriate non-parametric test to use. Now the, um, the idea behind parametric and non-parametric uh, boils down to, uh, to the term parametric where the, the tests that we've already used assume that the data meet certain assumptions. So, uh, so with the continuous outcome, it assumes that they're distributed normally. So, uh, and we all know what the normal distribution looks like. We don't need to revisit that necessarily. <coughs> or that the minimum value is at least five. Do we need to close this? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> So, uh, and, but we know not all data follow those assumptions, and, and so if those assumptions aren't met, uh, we can use a different type of procedure to test whether the, the groups are equivalent. And, uh, and those are called non-parametric procedures. Nice thing about non-parametric tests is that you have fewer assumptions that, that you need to satisfy. So, uh, so it doesn't need to follow the normal distribution. You don't need at least five uh, observations in each cell, but there's a sacrifice at the same time. It's less powerful than those parametric tests, which means that you're less likely to reject the null hypothesis. That means you're less likely to find a result if it's actually there, when you should. So some types of data that are non-parametric or ordinal data, often uh, you'll see that in an evaluation type of, a, uh, type of data uh, that's, uh, that's distributed in, in what's called the Likert scale, or some people call it the Likert scale. And, and that's just on a scale of one to five, uh, with, uh, with one being uh, strongly disagree and five being strongly agree and, and three being somewhere in the middle. Um, 
uh, often we'll, uh, we'll see that, that that type of data is, uh, is pretty highly skewed. Uh, also, when there are a lot of outliers, like hospital length of stay is a great example of that, uh, where most of our patients are discharged within uh, a little over a day. But, <clears throat> but we always get a few that stay for weeks or even months. And, uh, and that skews the data. Uh, or when there are clear limits of detection, like when there, uh, there are certain um, diagnostic tests that, that, that can only uh, detect within, within a certain range. This is an example of a, of a Likert scale, uh, looking at symptom severity, uh, often it, it, where we can see that the uh, responses tend to cluster around this slightly better bar. And, uh, and so how to tease out these, uh, the distribution is, uh, is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Or uh, continuous uh, uh, distribution with, uh, with uh, a few definite outliers. Uh, if you recall our, our box whisker uh, diagram that we've used before, the box uh, actually ranges from the first quartile up to the third quartile. This line in the middle again is the median. And, uh, and we can see that the, that the range of the data uh, ranges very far up uh, to the right. And so, so we have a, a few people who are staying in the hospital for a very long time, although about half of them are, uh, are within, well, I don't have a scale on this, within about a day or so. So the steps for non-parametric hypothesis testing are going to be exactly the same as, this, as the steps that we take in, uh, in any other uh, type of hypothesis testing. You're going to set up hypotheses, set up the level of significance using uh, our alpha uh, or the, uh, the probability of type 1 error. <coughs> select the appropriate test statistic, set up the decision rule, um, compute the test statistic, and state your conclusion, whether you're going to reject the null hypothesis or do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So uh, stepping back to our categorical data, remember if we can set it up in a, a, what we call a contingency table, uh, either 2 by 2 or uh, or some people call it an R by C uh, to, uh, to, um, to reflect rows by columns. <coughs> Usually, we want to be able to, uh, to evaluate that using a, a chi-square um, test of independence. And we can use the chi-square test if the smallest expected value is at least 5. Remember, with chi-square, you're looking at the observed values compared to the expected values <coughs> if, uh, if the, the marginal totals uh, held and, uh, and everything was distributed evenly. If, the, if that assumption isn't met, we're going to use what's called the Fisher's exact test. This is uh, one of the things about statistics that frustrates people. Tests don't necessarily describe exactly what they do. Um, usually, they are given the name of the person who thought them up. And so, uh, so we get things like Fisher's exact, and Will Cox and Rank Sum, and Man Whitney U, and Kruskal Wallace, um, as a, a just kind of a a, a way of, uh, of of honoring our forefathers in statistics, um, rather than saying exactly what it does. Although, uh, although if you uh, look carefully. Uh, <clears throat> What's, uh, what's nice about the Fisher's exact, the key word here being exact, uh, the concept here is actually to calculate the exact probability of seeing the data distributed the, the way that you have it. And we can actually calculate a p-value directly with the Fisher's exact test using the binomial distribution that we discussed before. Um, and, uh, and remember, the, the binomial distribution is, uh, is just uh, looking at the probability of seeing uh, the, a certain number of successes out of a certain number of trials. And so it's the probability of seeing the results as observed or, uh, or even more extreme than you got. So in this example uh, from our trauma data, um, looking at uh, these are, are uh, patients that, that came in that, that were injured in, in pedal cycle crashes, bicycle crashes, over the course of a year. Uh, and, uh, and whether or not they tested positive for, uh, for alcohol. And, and we can set that up in a two by two table, um, but, uh, but probably not appropriate to use chi-square because the minimum expected value here uh, is actually less than five, um, as we can see. <coughs> and uh, 
And so, uh, so the this uh, the way the Fisher's exact test works uh, is actually to look at the smallest value in the in the table uh, and uh, and literally just calculate the probability of seeing that smallest value. And you can look at it as uh, as the the probability of uh, of well in this case females testing positive for alcohol. So that's three out of seventeen. Um, I think that's somewhere around 17%. <clears throat> and what we would do then is calculate that probability and the probability that that cell uh, value is two and the probability that it's one and the probability that it's zero. All those probabilities added together equals the p-value. So the, the probability of, of seeing a, a result as extreme or more extreme than that. <clears throat> and um, and this is the equation, but through the magic of uh, statistical software, we don't necessarily need to uh, calculate that by hand. This is uh, how we would go about getting that in SPSS. And, uh, and so what we would do is just run, uh, go through the, the cross-tab procedure, select patient sex and, uh, and alcohol result. <clears throat> and, uh, and we have uh, an option for statistics, and for that, we just check chi-square, and within the, within the, the chi-square result, it actually uh, returns Fisher's exact results as well, as we'll see. So here's the, the cross-tab uh, that, that it returns, uh, and it will, uh, it will yell at you down here uh, in the bottom and say one cell has an expected count of less than five. You see that? That means you should actually use the Fisher's exact test. Although it does give, uh, give all the, uh, um, the options for the, the different chi-square um, results. And then we just look at the, uh, the exact significance. That's the p-value. And for, uh, for two-sided, that just means that there's a, uh, a difference, but you're not stating direction. And we can see, uh, in this case, p-value is 0.558. That is not significant at all. <coughs> and so uh, in that case, you would not reject the null hypothesis that uh, in, in this case, the uh, uh, probability of testing positive for alcohol is different for uh, men versus women um, who come in with, uh, with injuries sustained in a bicycle crash. So that was a categorical outcome where we have an expected value less than five. That's the, um, uh, the Fisher's exact test. If we have two independent samples and it's a, a continuous or ordinal outcome, <coughs> What we're going to use is called the Man Whitney U. Again, this is what I'm talking about, where the title isn't necessarily descriptive of what it does. Um, it's also called the Man -Whit Whitney Wilcoxon test, um, but I actually like the Wilcoxon rank sum test. Rank sum uh, just describes exactly what it does. You you uh, you rank all of your observations, put them in order, and add uh, all of those ranks up. So what you're looking at is the ranks, not the actual values, although you do need the values to, to establish the ranks in the first place. So it's used to compare continuous uh, variables that are not normally distributed and that are in two groups. <coughs> and, uh, and again, that's all you're going to do is just pool the data and rank the observations from lowest to highest. <coughs> this is a, a, a made-up example. Uh, phase two clinical trial that's looking at a new uh, drug for, for kids uh, for, to treat their asthma. Uh, so let's say we've got 10 participants and they're randomized to either the drug or the placebo. <coughs> and, uh, and we're asking the participants to record the number of episodes of shortness of breath over the course of a week. So we've got five kids taking the placebo, five taking the, the new drug, uh, and we can see the, the number of uh, episodes of shortness of breath um, uh, over, uh, over the, the course of that week. <clears throat> Null hypothesis is simply going to be that the two populations are distributed equally, uh, and alternative that the two populations are not distributed equally. Uh, we can't say the mean because they're not normally distributed, so uh, so we're not interested in uh, in actually what the mean says. There, <clears throat> and this is how how the data looks when we put it in a table, but uh, but we need to put it in order. And so what we're going to do is rank them all uh, together making sure that we keep track of, uh, of what group each individual is in while we rank them. <clears throat> uh, 
There is a, uh, a rule though. Uh, occasionally what you get is, uh, uh, occasionally you will get ties. So we've got uh, a, a kid on the drug and a kid on the placebo who, who each had four episodes of shortness of breath. Uh, and same deal out here. Uh, we've got two kids who, who each had six episodes of shortness of breath. So what do we do with those? Well, uh, we rank these. There's uh, uh, one that had one episode. Uh, uh, that person's ranked uh, number one. Uh, and then one with two, that's two. No one with three, that's three. But then we've got this, these two with four. Uh, they just get the average of ranks four and five, which works out to be 4.5. <clears throat> so they get the same rank. Um, and, uh, and so on. For, uh, for those that, that are tied down here, they get the average of seven and eight, seven and a half. Then we just add up the ranks in each group. So the, uh, uh, so the sum of the ranks for the placebo is this uh, you know, 4.5 plus 6 plus 7.5 plus 9 plus 10. And so that comes out to be 37 for the drug. That sum uh, ends up being 18. Um, nice little uh, rule that uh, so you can check your data is that the, the sum of the ranks is actually going to be equal to uh, to, to this formula here, uh, that's n, the total number of observations, times n plus 1, uh, divided by 2. So, <coughs> so, uh, so, the, uh, so the total sum of, uh, of ranks for, uh, for 10 observations is going to be 10 times 11 divided by 2, which is 55, uh, which works out to be 18 plus 37. So we can kind of check our, uh, our math there to make sure that we didn't goof up yet. Okay. So uh, our test statistic for Man Whitney U or Wilcoxon rank sum uh, is going to be the smaller value of this uh, this value. We're going to just call it U. Um, that uh, without really going in, into details, basically what it looks at is the difference between the uh, the sum of the ranks for that group and what would have been expected if uh, or what the the sum of the ranks would have been if that was the only group. <coughs> And so, uh, so for group one, the value of u is, uh, is three. For group two, the value of u is 22. <coughs> and then we find a critical value in, um, uh, in a table. These tables are readily available. And in fact, I've got one on this presentation for, uh, for samples of size five and five. And the critical value to reject there is two. And, uh, and what's different, another thing that's different about non-parametric tests uh, often is that you reject if the value is less than the critical value here. <coughs> so, uh, so our lowest value is three. That's not less than or equal to the critical value to reject. So we do not reject, even though it looked like it uh, probably uh, was uh, uh, differently distributed be between those two, two groups. Uh, just kind of a reminder that non-parametric tests are very conservative and you're less likely to, uh, <coughs> to uh, reject a null hypothesis um, when you're using them, especially uh, partly because you do have uh, very small sample sizes uh, with these. Um, of course, we can use SPSS to, uh, to do non-parametric tests. Uh, and we just go to analyze, find the non-parametric test. And in this case, we'd go to independent samples. <coughs> and, uh, and it actually does a lot of the work for you, which can be a little bit dangerous because you need to understand which one you're, uh, what, what it actually means. But, uh, but um, you do have the option to automatically compare the distribution uh, across groups. We'll just uh, choose that. <coughs> and you can choose Man Whitney U if you have, uh, have two samples that you want to uh, test to um, non-normally distributed um, groups. And, and in this case, we'll choose, uh, again, uh, well, length of stay in days versus uh, alcohol uh, toxicology. And um, it's not a terribly informative uh, hypothesis test, but it, uh, it actually does cut right the, to the chase. It gives you the null hypothesis saying that the distribution of length of stay is the same across categories of alcohol. Uh, it uh, tells you that it's using the independent samples Man Whitney U test uh, and tells you what the p-value is, 0 0.015. Uh, and <coughs> decision is, uh, and, and it uh, thinks for you here. It, it says reject the null hypothesis because there are p-values less than 0 0.05. Um, so apparently length of stay is different depending on uh, 
whether you have been drinking before you got on your bicycle. <clears throat> All right, so that was two independent samples. So we're uh, comparing the, the medians or the, the distribution of, uh, of a continuous, non-normally distributed um, variable across uh, uh, compare, comparing two groups. Um, what if we have matched samples? So the same, same individual, we're taking the, the measurement before and after or at, at two different times. Uh, so we're just looking at the difference for each individual. Um, <clears throat> in, a, in a parametric test, so, uh, so where we can use a t-test, we're just uh, looking at the mean of the differences. And our null hypothesis is going to be the, that the mean of the differences is zero. Uh, with uh, non-parametric, we're looking at median. Uh, saying that the median difference is, uh, is zero. Kind of a, a subtle difference, but, uh, but it's important. Uh, and in this, uh, another kind of made up example, we've got a new drug to reduce repetitive behaviors uh, in kids with autism. There are uh, eight children who are observed for uh, three hours before starting the treatment and after one week of, uh, on the treatment. And, uh, and they're given a score from zero to 100, uh, which is the percent of time spent engaged in repetitive behavior. And <clears throat> here's our data. We can see uh, that, uh, that child one had 85% uh, of the time was engaged in, uh, in repetitive behavior uh, at baseline, 75% after one week, uh, and so on down the line. So the first thing we've got to do is calculate a difference. So uh, in this case, uh, we're just taking the before minus after. So I, it may be a little bit confusing, but it, in this case, a positive uh, difference means that the, uh, it went down from time one to time two. Just important to, uh, to make it clear what you're, uh, what you're talking about there. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, and so we can see some of these are positive, some of them are negative. <coughs> This is probably the, <clears throat> the simplest test that exists. <clears throat> it's called the, the sign test. Null hypothesis is uh, still going to be that the median difference is zero. Alternative hypothesis, uh, we, can, uh, we can state it either way that, that, that the median difference is positive, negative, or, <clears throat> or not zero. And, uh, and uh, well, doing the, the sign test, is only looking at the number of signs. So either look the looking at the number of, uh, of negative differences uh, compared to the number of positive differences. That's it. It's not looking at the magnitude. Uh, and the test statistic is going to be the smaller of either the positive or negative signs. In this case, we had six that had a positive difference, two that had a negative difference. So we're, uh, our value is going to be two for those two negative differences. Um, <clears throat> and there is a... Uh, uh, a table for the sign test that we can use, um, but uh, but this happens to also be a binomial uh, binomial distributed um, test that, that we can use, and uh, and so it's uh, it's relatively easy to calculate um, if you uh, if you're able to, to do the bi binomial distribution. So for for eight observations, uh, our one-sided alpha. Remember, we're using one-sided because our alternative hypothesis is that the median difference is positive. Um, the uh, the value, the critical value for that is one. So uh, so in other words, <coughs> in order for uh, for it to be significant, there can only be one, a maximum of one, uh, in the uh, the smaller of the positive or negative signs. <coughs> so. We'll reject the null hypothesis if the smaller number of positive negative signs is less than or equal to one. We had two negative signs, so we do not reject, and we conclude that there is not a significant difference, or that the median difference is uh, is not um, positive. This is these are the critical values for the sign test, and you, you can see uh, that it's it's pretty difficult to reject if you have a uh, have a small sample size here. Um, and here's the one-sided alpha uh, for an N of eight is uh, just one. As we go up, it gets higher, but, uh, but not a heck of a lot. Um, and again, the p-value for the sign test is just the binomial distribution where uh, N is the number of subjects. Uh, we're testing this with a, a probability of success at uh, 0.5. Uh, and, uh, and X for the uh, binomial distribution is just going to be the smaller number of signs. And so uh, we can actually calculate the p-value 
uh, for uh, yeah, a probability of having uh, two successes or fewer uh, under those conditions. Okay. There's another option that actually takes into account the magnitude of the different scores, and that's called the Wilcoxon signed rank test. So again, we're ranking them, uh, and we're going to take a sum as, uh, as well, but, uh, but the signs come into play too. <clears throat> so we've got the, we start off exactly the same way. We've got all the observations. We calculate the difference, uh, differences, and we uh, keep track of whether it's a positive or negative difference. But then we put them in order according to absolute value. So, uh, so in this case, uh, we've got a difference of, uh, of negative 5, so the, and that's, that's our lowest absolute value of, uh, of the difference, so that's ranked 1. Um, and uh, we've got three absolute values of 10, so that gets the, uh, the average of 2, 3, and 4, uh, which is 3, so they each get a rank of 3, uh, and so on. Uh, and then we uh, put the, uh, the sign on each rank. So if, it, if it's negative, the signed rank is negative. Uh, if it's positive, the signed rank is positive. <coughs> And then we add them all up. The, um, so going through the steps of hypothesis testing, null hypothesis is, the, uh, again, going to be the median difference is 0. Alternative hypothesis is the median difference is positive. Uh, test statistic is, uh, uh, we'll call it w in this case. So it's the smaller of either the uh, w positive, so the sum of the positive ranks, or the sum of the negative ranks. So the sum of the positive ranks in this case was 32. Uh, there were only uh, two negatives. Um, and, uh, and they added up to four. There was a one and three. Uh, and so in this case, um, there's also a, a table for the Wilcox and sign rank test that, uh, that you can look up. It's also included in, uh, in this slideshow. Um, where with a, with a n sample size of eight, the one-sided alpha of at 0.05 uh, is uh, the critical value is going to be six. Um, <coughs> in this case, uh, our, our uh, some of the, the negative ranks is less than that, so we actually can reject the null hypothesis uh, and say that we have uh, significant evidence that the median difference is positive. So, um, and here is that, uh, that table for, uh, for the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Again, we're, we're looking at the one-sided alpha of 0.05, counting down to n of 8, uh, and the critical value there is going to be 6. Uh, if it's more than two independent samples, <clears throat> uh, remember, with a, with a continuous uh, outcome that actually follows a normal distribution, we're going to use that uh, analysis of variance. So we're comparing the variance between groups to the variance within the groups, uh, trying to, to separate out the signal from the noise. Uh, with ordinal, we do what's called the Kruskal-Wallace test. <clears throat> and again, why they don't name it something more uh, uh, descriptive, I'm not sure. Uh, the idea here is to compare the medians among uh, more than two groups. And, uh, and like all of our other non-parametric tests, it's just using ranks uh, instead of the, the actual values. So the null hypothesis, again, is just going to be that all the population medians are equal. Alternative hypothesis is that they're not. And as uh, another example, this is a study to assess the albumin levels in adults with low protein diets. So we've got three diets uh, that have different levels of protein, one with 5%, one with 10%, one with 15%. And we're going to see what the albumin levels are uh, on those guys. And, uh, and, and we can see the, the distribution here. Uh, we've got a very small sample size in each of these groups. And, uh, and they're unequal, and so it's uh, not necessarily distributed normally. So uh, so, th so this uh, is uh, appropriate to, to use a non-parametric test, in this case the Kruskal-Wallace. Again, the null hypothesis is that the three population medians are the same. Uh, alternative hypothesis, they're not. A and so, like everything else, we start by putting them in order uh, and establishing ranks. Again, we've got a tie here uh, for the second and third lowest, uh, and so they just get the average uh, of two and three uh, on that. and then. Uh, we, uh, we sum up the ranks for all of these uh, and, uh, and take a look at them. There is a, uh, a rather relatively complex equation uh, for the Kruskal-Wallace test statistic. Uh, 
where you you uh, you take into account the all of those sums of ranks and their sample sizes and uh, and the the total sample size. <clears throat> In this case, uh, we'll call it H. Uh, that comes out to 7.52, uh, and we have another table that we can refer to to find the critical value. I know this is teeny tiny, and you probably can't even see this at home. Uh, but, uh, but the idea behind this is to look at the number of groups. So it says k equals 3, so we've got three groups, uh, and, and it shows the sample sizes. In this case, we had a sample size of 5, one of 4, one of 3, uh, and that critical value is 5.656. <clears throat> so this is the one non-parametric test where we, uh, we reject if the value that we calculate is higher than that critical value. Uh, our critical value was 7.5-something, uh, um, and the, the, so our, our value that we calculated was 7.5. The critical value to reject is 5.6, uh, and so, uh, so we can reject this and conclude that uh, that the median that there is a difference in, in the median values among those three groups. Um, just to show an example of how we can just run this using statistical software, <clears throat> I looked at the length of stay in days by age group uh, of uh, of patients, and uh, and and we can see that yeah, it looks like the the mean is uh, is pretty different here. Uh, we've got the 65 and older staying for a, an average of eight days, but the median's 2.9 for, for that group, and the rest of them are, are somewhere around one, one and a half. So we're gonna probably expect that, that this is actually gonna be different. But since it's, uh, since length of stay is not normally distributed, uh, we can use that kruskal wallace test. Again, we're gonna go look at those uh, non-parametric tests, and we'll just let, the, let the, uh, the program automatically compare the distribution across groups. We'll choose the fields as length of stay in days and age group. In this case, it's age group two because I've set up a whole bunch of different uh, uh, combinations of age groups. Uh, and, uh, and what the heck, we'll let it uh, automatically choose the, the test. But um, if we wanted to have a little more control, uh, we would just check this box for Kruskal Wallace one way ANOVA for, uh, uh, for KU samples. And it is just as informative as the last one, where it, uh, it returns the null hypothesis that, that the distribution of length of stay in days is the same across categories of age group, using that independent samples Kruskal Wallace test, and it returns a significance of uh, 0 0.001 uh, and tells you you must reject this null hypothesis. Uh, the, the medians are, there is at least one difference in the, in the medians. Again, like the ANOVA, it doesn't tell you where the difference is, but at least eyeballing it, we can see that, uh, that the length of stay was, uh, was quite a bit longer uh, in our, uh, our older patients. So, just to sum up, uh, these are the, the tests that, that we covered today. We already covered chi-square tests, t-test, analysis of variance, and, and pair t-test, uh, but we've added to our arsenal the Man Whitney U. Uh, remember, that's also called the Wilcoxon rank sum test, where we uh, just rank a continuous outcome. And, uh, and compare the, the sum of the ranks uh, between two groups. Kruskal Wallace test is where we have more than two groups, but the, it's a continuous outcome that's not normally distributed, or we have a very small sample size. Uh, if it's dependent and we're just looking at the difference uh, within individuals, uh, we're going to use the sign test or the Wilcoxon signed ranks test if we want to actually be able to find something. And and to sum up, um, even if uh, our data don't meet those uh, assumptions of normality, we can still uh, perform some hypothesis tests. Um, reminder that non-parametric tests are generally just based on the ranks of the data rather than the actual values. Um, although, of course, you do need the values to establish the ranks to begin with. Still subject to the same errors that parametric tests. In fact, it's more prone to, uh, to type 2 error, which is where you're less likely to find a result when you really should. All right, so next time, uh, we're gonna get into some multivariable statistics. Uh, talk a little bit about linear regression, logistic regression, where we can adjust for, uh, for some confounders and actually put multiple independent variables in the same model uh, and, uh, and adjust for the confounding effects of that. Um, so uh, with continuous uh, data or categorical data. Any questions? <laughs>